continually the push the crossover. And I was just asking before the another sense of next week's agenda really has been a construct agenda for next week because you know one seems to be a fairly likely outcome is that we hit the crossover and that leadership used that as a moment to take a break as opposed to calling a break now with two days to cross over. So all the way of saying I'm I'm reluctant to set up the agenda for next week, but we have a very clear agenda for the next few days. So if you be a break until what when next year sometime when the coronavirus well, I mean, they think it's gonna go away. People throw around, you know, a month, two weeks, three weeks. I agree with you. I, I think it's here to stay yeah. for a while. And then how do you I suppose if if everybody were to take that month break, you might be able to slow it down. But since it's happening institution by institution and school district by school district and you know, there will be some states where they underperform and some where they will I just think it's gonna be with us for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. And would they keep the same adjournment, or would they try to add it? Well, I, I mean, these are all yeah. follow-on questions. Um, you know, if you talk to some people, they will say we, we should just punt to the budget, complete the budget, and a couple, you know, the transportation bill and the capital bill, and go go home. But you know, every committee's done a half a session's worth of work, so. Hopeful that whatever solution we come up with that involves an end game where we at least have a chance to figure out priority. To Speaking of which, um, I put this on your desks, um, and I, I guess I'll walk us through it because I, this isn't from Jim. It's incorporating Jim's language and some committee discussion and some ideas that I had. I'll just read through it and verbally annotate it a little bit with the understanding that it's not um, vetted legal language. So Jim will tell me if I'm off base. Um, what we do I just rewrote it upstairs. What's that? I just rewrote this upstairs for you. Okay. But do, you, do you have the rewritten? <laughs> no, no, yeah. It's okay. a small paragraph leaning down, but actually, it's very, my rewrite is like very small stuff. So, okay. Yeah, it's great. So I added a finding section, section 11 of number 173 of the 2018 Acts and Resolves <coughs> directed the Agency of Education to undertake a study examining and evaluating the current formula used to weight economically disadvantaged students, English language learners, secondary level and preschool students in Vermont. At the same time, the study was to consider whether new cost factors and weights should be included in the utilized pupil calculation. The December 2019. Hey, there are reference to preschool. I don't think preschool was was part of that. At least Tammy said that she was instructed to do preschool. Oh, okay. So we yeah, can eliminate that. Yeah, so. I was just responding to the on the chart that she put on your she put in the report. But okay. It wasn't part of the chart. Yeah, the four four six was an nice to look at that. So, okay. yeah. The December twenty nineteen findings produced by medium led team of researchers, including national experts on student waiting, were stark. Quote this is all from uh, Tammy Colby's report. Neither the factors considered by the current formula nor the value of the wage reflect contemporary education circumstances and costs. According to the research team, more unsettling still with their finding that, quote, values for the existing weights have weak ties, if any, with evidence describing the difference in costs of educating students with disparate needs or operating schools in different contexts. As a corrective to this situation, the major recommendations of the report are straightforward that the legislature increase certain of the existing weights and that add population density, rurality as a new weighting factor. Given the reports finding that rural districts pay more to educate a student and have been historically underfunded in this regard. Given the statewide nature of Vermont's education funding system, however, the reality that any change in weight formula will produce fluctuations in the tax rates across the map, the legislature has chosen to develop a phase approach to implementation of the findings. Um, and then this goes into Jim's language. Uh, it adds, as per Ruth's 
suggestion that they develop the plan of implementation in collaboration with SBE and the stakeholders from the education community, lists a few. Um, and then this is basically what Jim had for what the plan shall include. And then on the next page, as part of this collaboration with the Agency of Education on Subsection A of the section, on or before December 1st, 2020, the State Board of Education shall hold not less than six public meetings in different regions of the state, both to help educate the public about the financial realities of the waiting formula and any changes thereto, and to gather public input on the waiting report for the proposed implementation. This testimony, the board shall refer to the Agency of Education the input to form this plan of implementation. And they give it to us by December 15th. That gives the committees of jurisdiction and the money committees a couple of weeks to look it over and see what they think. Section three is an explicit um, marker that there has to be a vote to activate this plan of implementation. During the first year of the 2020 2022 biennium House and Senate Committees on Education will consider the agency's plan of implementation, making such changes as they deem necessary. A positive vote of both the House and the Senate and the signature of the government will then be required to put the plan of implementation into effect. I know that people know their civics and know it would require the governor's signature, but I wanted to make it clear that everybody at every level in January will look at that report and then have to sign off before it goes into effect. Um, so let's make sure you can pass that signature. So oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're doing just that. Yeah. Fair. Fair so um, this was an attempt to uh, add a little bit of context in the findings and then to clarify the, the kind of implementation process that at least I'm hoping to put into motion. So it would be, it would go into effect on passage. That would leave about six or seven months before um, the implementation plan is due. So that gives the agency time, it gives the board time to do their thing. I did speak with John Carroll about the idea of the board going out into the state. He really liked that idea, he thinks that's the sort of thing they should be doing. Um, and we have uh, Emily here. Any any thoughts immediately, Emily? I anticipated that you would ask me to do the comments, so I asked my thoughts, what I should say. Okay. So I think you should have a board meeting to make sure that this is what the board is Implement immediately or step? Does that that you should take the action to put the recommendations of the study that you think are best into law. Right. Um, so, comments on this or what Emily just said, or questions for Jim about the legality of it? So, in terms of the findings, um, I think that um, the sentence, neither the factors considered by the current formula nor the weights, of blah, 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 that I'm, I'm a little not sure how I feel about the more unsettling. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the fact that the cur current values, so those, the weights have been in existence for a long time and Maybe they never had any basis. Maybe they did. They didn't find any evidence either way. Yeah. They certainly don't now. But school funding formulas are usually not changed in a major way for 20 to 25 years. So the point where we're at right now is not actually unique to school funding formulas across the nation. They usually are in existence for a couple decades before there are major overhauls to mm -hmm. them. So I guess I wouldn't want to overstate 
that we have done something any radically different than any other state. Mm -hmm. That this is just part of the process of updating a school finance formula. And so making sure that it's that the values, the current values are as they currently exist, don't ha have weak ties. Um, so what would your recommendation? Um, well, <clears throat> according to the research team, the weighting the weighting factors as they currently currently existing the currently existing I'm not sure but something in that and getting rid of the more unsettling I'm not that's I don't, I'm not sure I mean the whole findings thing always kind of okay become so, problematic for me but um, suppose we kept the first quote according to the research team semicolon um, the uh, team also found that quote values for the existing weights have been tied. Sure, the current values for yeah. putting in current, and then in the next. Are you, you get that? Jim? Sorry, yeah. Jim. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the that the legislature increase certain of the existing weights and that add. I, I think we should say the existing weights for poverty and English language learners. Where students. are you now? The next sentence, as, cor as a corrective to the situation, the major recommendations of the report are straightforward, that the legislature increase certain of the existing weights. And you want to list which ones? And they also, didn't, they all, didn't the report also say to increase <laughs> not only poverty and ELL, but also cool. secondary? They added the middle school thing. So that uh, but yeah, that's in here. Yeah, I, I didn't um, I didn't list which, but there are several that are that remain the same, and then a number that change. Uh, so do you want to list the ones that? Well, I think I want to make it clear that it's not just rurality that is the issue. It's all it's, in fact, even more significantly poverty and ELL. There, right. Uh, those, so those are going to increase. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want? To, is your suggestion that we list them specifically? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, such a, where where have they been listed? In the first, yeah, because yeah. they're already um, first years. Oh, I see. Okay, then that's fine. But I guess okay. That's what the study was. Yeah. They, yeah. They would be increased. Yeah, I think naming specifically, but then. I, and the historically underfunded that I think there's I don't know exactly how to say it but um, because budgets are, are are determined at the local level mm -hmm. they have the local level has a, a but underweighted, maybe not underfunded. They could have funded them. Yeah. Well, they just wanted to raise the taxes. It says historically underfunded in this regard. In other words, there are a number of factors about how they reach their funding. One of them is the weighting formula. One of them is their budget. One of them is their voters, et cetera. Um, so, uh, I mean, it seems to me that the upshot of the report is that it's saying that the current values don't reflect the cost and haven't for decades. Um, so that's why I use the phrase historically underfunded. Um, but I'm not wed to it if there's a, it just seems to me a kind of something that's true on its face if you accept the report. Court? Let's say if you say historically underfunded, you're going to say Act 60 never was the or 68. Oh, I don't, I don't view it that way. It's only 20 years old. Right, but the, the weighting formula pre, well, predates Act 60 and Act 60. Mm -hmm. So it's a, people will, of course, want to always talk about Act 60, but it's really a different. That was trying to solve a different problem. Act 60 was trying to yes. solve a different problem. But people have confused them. We heard that in the testimony yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, mm -mm. I mean, 
we don't have to have that final Maybe clause just, there. Yeah, just stop at student. I pay more to educate a student. Um, I was also trying to reflect some of the testimony we heard last night. Um, I think every witness, this was part of their message. We, we have been ignored for a long time. So I was trying to capture that in a less inflammatory yeah. way. My question also, and I am sensitive to what Emily said and would like to actually hear a little bit more from her if she's willing, but um, the, in terms of the logistics of this, on or before December 20, uh, 1st, December 1st, 2020, the state board shall hold those hearings and then on or before, no later than December 15th, the agency would develop a plan and submit it to these committees. But given that there's an election before then, do these committees actually exist? How does that work? Well, the committees continue. So it would still be us, well, even I if mean, none of us get reelected. Yeah, it, it'll, <laughs> it'll, 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 the constitution of the committee might change, but the committee will always be here. And similarly with the agency. And so the, there's no lack of continuity because of the election. Is that what you're saying? Well, I guess, you know, just practically speaking, who's how would the education committee then be able to react between December 15th and the start of the session? Well, or typically do anything? these reports go to the chairs. Yeah. And whether we're voted in or out, we're still the chairs until um, January. Right. Right. So there's time to do a couple of weeks of looking, talking, sharing with leadership, et cetera, kind of preparing the ground, um, you know, given the rate at which incumbents are returned. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to believe that, you know, all, almost all of us who are running are coming back, mm -hmm. probably. Um, so I don't, I don't worry about it in that regard, and it's very common to try to use that period yeah. to have a couple of months before the session starts to get something. Um, I mean, we could make it January 1st. It's no. just, it'll push it back. No, I mean, I think December 15th is fine. I'm just curious about, like, practically how it would work um, since yeah. I haven't been here during that yeah. interim session part before. And then, um, yeah, how's I guess I'm... How's the fog? <laughs> Stop teasing me. <laughs> um, I, I guess I, I want to... Very, very long. No, I do have other questions. I'm just curious to hear more from Emily about her thought, of, or from the agency, since she's the designated agency person in the room. If you can say more about that. Sure. So the agency does not have the capacity or, the capacity or expertise to do this work for you. Uh, you should have the minimum appropriate funds for a contract to be written for a party that does have the expertise and the capacity. Um, our secretary had immediate concerns about this swamping the agency and putting the implementation of Act 173 on hold since this is um, at the same time as those final stages of Act 173 implementation. I, so that was the answer that Rebecca Holcomb gave me when we had initially passed the legislative requirement to do the study. And so we ultimately did pay $250,000 study that Professor Colby did, but given that the findings are, are there and this directs implementation of those values, it's hard for me to see how this would swamp the agency. Um, That's the opinion of the guy who runs it. Understood. Yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and then to go to your point, so the, the direction here in your 2A is to use the weighting changes under the heading new weight derived from models with controls for students with disabilities. So I was just going to pull it up and refresh my memory. It's but in maybe, the executive summary of the. And you're confident that that's sufficiently clear. Does that leave decisions for the agency to make 
within the report. There are several options yes. and branches that you can take within the report. Yeah, I, I does. Yeah. The, the way it's set up here is that um, I don't know if everybody has the executive summary, but if you don't, so it's this page five. There's a table, and so it's the values on the far right of that table, um, and that is the values. And this coming out of our discussions we've had so far, this does not adjust for um, students with disabilities. And it does not attempt to get rid of the small school grant. There were two options that they were both put out. So this is the, the simplest of the options. Um, and leaves in place the categorical grants. Okay, I'm looking at that table. Yeah. Um, my reading of the report, and I could go back and do it again, was that for any recommendation where population density rates were recommended, that that was in lieu of the small school grant as an existing grant. Okay, I, I, from my discussion with Professor Colby, that wasn't the impression I got. But if that's the case, then it, it simplifies my life a little more, I think. Okay. Because it would, it would take out the necessity to be calculating small school grant. My, my. I, 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 think, I think the way it works is, is it's a one stage for population density. It's just a, a population per square mile calculation. Um, if you spot school grant, you have to both meet the population density requirement and have low, low enough enrollment in school. So it's a double test to get to. But so that, yeah, I think that's how it works. So so this wouldn't in and of itself be a replacement for the small school. No, no, this would not be, in my, my view at least, you, you could then decide if you wanted to add the small school <coughs> grant, yeah. but it would be dependent upon first meeting that population density test and then having a small school. Yeah, I, I had asked Professor Colby last night for the, the, the simplest stripped down recommendation without the small school grant and without yeah, yeah. Um, students with disabilities figured in, and this was the, the which I, thought that she confirmed that that was the yeah. yeah, I was just going to say about the small schools grant, I, I think it's a policy decision as to whether or not we get rid of the small schools grant. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, in my opinion, doing both is overkill, and that we, if we do the rural rurality measure that she proposes, there's not a need for the small schools grant, or it's, to, it's, it's double counting that sort mm -hmm. of small rural school issue. And so I guess to Emily's point a little bit is that there are a number of policy decisions that have to be made in order to create an implementation plan. And what is your alternative? You know, I ideally we have, would have started working on this immediately this well, session and did. put together a proposal to move forward with how we were going to implement it and made those policy decisions we, we through our what? We did not do that. Yeah. So, so for um, now, then I, then I think, you know, having, and this is what I was trying to argue before, is that we have some kind of implementation committee that would include the Secretary of Education or his designee and various players, and that we have an implementation that makes recommendations to the, to then, to the legislature about the policy decisions they want to make. And I think we could designate that recommendation ability to the secretary and say we want to hear what you're recommending for these policy decisions but then it would put him in the position of recommending do we keep small schools grants or not do we which which scenario do we should we do do we include special education do we you know what do we do with the spending caps what do we do with uh, merge versus unmerged districts uh, these kinds of policy decisions and certainly he can make recommendations and we can yeah. take them or leave them. I, I think it's a waste of time, frankly, to impanel a second study. Because we we just paid a quarter of a million dollars for a very authoritative study committee 
what we're lacking is an actual plan of implementation from the agency that will be in charge of it. I'm not su suggesting a study committee. I'm, you're suggesting to have the secretary make these decisions, these policy decisions, no. and make an implementation. That's what are we asking him to implement? He's coming back to the plan of implementation, which we will then work on. That's what the language says. So if we don't like something that the agency has done, we will change it and bring it to the floor. So we're not surrendering our policy <coughs> prerogative. But we are saying that we want the agency to come to us with a plan in terms of how will we phase this in over the next three years so that we don't wind up in a situation where we say to them, do this, and then they take an additional year to create how they're going to do it. That's the way it usually works. This tries to save a little bit of time by just immediately directing them to create their plan of implementation, which we can review and then authorize or not. The, the plan of implementation is deciding how we want the new formula to be. It's deciding on a, an, on a funding formula. So it's making policy decisions about but what this, the new formula this is. This language gives them <coughs> the weights. So it, it makes the signal policy decisions, which is use this category of weights and then create a phased implementation plan. The which, which weights, though? The ones that are described in the language as new weight derived from models with controls for SWD. So I understand the agency's uh, reluctance. I think they would prefer usually not to be directed to do X, Y, or Z. Um, in this case, we need them to do this. We need Brad James and others to work on this, which they will do anyway, whether we offer what we're calling a plan of implementation or not. Um, but I think this is a way for the agency to get their heads around it, produce a plan that will then be massaged when it gets into the building, and also for the state board to be simultaneously doing outreach to various communities. So uh, with, um, with respect to this um, last suggestion, I guess there are two possibilities on the table. Um, I've outlined one in this. I think what Ruth is talking about is significantly different. It's another study committee. It's not another study committee. Yeah, it's more like a, like a work group or an, an implementation yeah. group, um, making the policy decisions and then making proposals about how. But they won't come up with uh, an agency authored plan. They, they will come up with a group of stakeholders believe this. That's what we get from any task force, study committee, Blue Ribbon Commission. What well, we can also do a legislative implementation committee that is essentially members of the legislature that recommends policy. To, you know, this is what we as the members, the designated members of the two education committees and finance committees recommend. We could do that. And because we're the policy makers that need to make these policy decisions. Because it really is, it's a mathematical formula that we have to figure out what are the factors we want in the mathematical formula that we want to then impose on, on so school districts. In the interest of time, um, I, I'd like to straw pull the committee on these approaches. So we'll definitely spend more time working on this language, but if the committee wants to go with the agency approach, then I'd, I'd rather not continue the discussion about whether we have another kind of work. So where are we? Well, we're kind of in a pickle if the agency doesn't want to do it, aren't we? No. We're not. I, I don't think we are at all. I, I don't support the leading study period, so I'm not going to have a hope for anything that progresses it. 
What do you mean you don't support the study? Like you don't support implementing the study? Or you don't think the study exists? Or what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> the study exists, but I can create any study and come with any kind of weight. So. so it's really that the change, you don't support making any changes to the weighting formula. Not the changes that are proposed. That, in that study. I'm with the agency. Okay. I have trust in them to do it. Do it right. Well, they they, they will need it. to. They will need to do it anyway. <laughs> it's right. It's a it's a distinction without a difference because if we it's handed to them, they'll do it. They won't need to do it if we tell Brad James this is what you need to put in your formula in your spreadsheet because we've made the policy decisions that this yeah. is what the weight's going to be and this is the number of years we're going to take to implement it and this is what we're going to do with small schools grants and this is what we're going to do with X, Y, and Z. He will program his formula to make to, to run the school aids formula for school districts. Just like... Yeah. Which, just that's like, what he will do in this case. Right? He'll do the, the... But then the agency will have to make the policy decisions about what, what to include or exclude. No, we, we have made the basic policy decisions here. What we've asked them to do is tease out, and this goes back to your original um, point, to tease out interactions with Act 173, et cetera, which this asks them to do as they create a phased approach. So the agency supports implementing the way if we told them, we want you to do it, here are the values, do it right now. They would have to do this work anyway. They would have to sit down and discuss, are there problems with this? Do we need to create a different timeline? Do we need to watch out for this intersection with this piece of law, et cetera? They're always going to be doing that work. So whether we ask them to create an implementation report or ask them to just implement it, they're going to still do the same kind of work. I mean... Do you see a difference, Emily? I mean, I... Excuse you, me. Sorry. I, I will call the witnesses. We're right now strong voting, so I do need to hear from the other two. Can I ask you a question? The, so um, these three um, items here at the bottom of the first page, it, that that would be the policy direction. Is that any, that's yes. Just your intention is that, that that's the policy direction that would be given to the agency, and that's what yes. they would use. To so they do. have the values. They know we want it done over three years, mm -hmm. um, and what we're asking for is um, a plan that will also a consideration of the new form of interaction with other provisions of existing law including excess spending penalty, hold harmless, dot, dot, dot. That's the kind of thing that Brad James routinely does. <coughs> so what, I'm, what I view this as is giving them relatively solid parameters in terms of the weights, the number of years for implementation, and then asking them over a course of six or seven months to formalize it into a plan that we can vote for. Can I ask Ruth a question? Please. Ruth, so if if this was to happen, it seems like what you want to happen would happen maybe next January. Like that then we would get the report back and then we as a committee and 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 the, and the other committees obviously, but we would then have those same discussions and where we would decide we agree or don't agree with what the agency has done. Right. Is it just so you're you're feeling that that we're just kind of missing an opportunity to get involved early that we then have to like wait to react to their study instead of? Yeah. It seems I mean, like we get there with what you want, but we just have to. They they kind of set the table, then we come to the table, then we could change it, but we'd have to react to what they did. I guess my concern is that this this. This is out there, and people are already um, interpreting it in the way that they want. And we have barely done any work on it. We took a very small amount of testimony. That's not true. We had testimony from the Please author. Don't put of this. into the record that we barely did any work. 
we we had a public hearing we had a public hearing and we, we heard from the a visit to a district we heard from the author of the report we took testimony that's more than we've done for most issues I, but we haven't discussed as a committee the decisions about the policy decisions that would have to be made about the the things that you list and the the, th the factors that are going to come up so what we're asking is we're asking the agency to do that work that we didn't do that work and that then next year we'll look, review the agency's plan for implementing it and then decide whether we like the implementation plan or not and so we i i it, it Yes, it, it, we may get to the same point, but we're then gonna then then the agency's plan is gonna be out there, and people are gonna make assumptions about that agency plan, and it's gonna have people are gonna, and then we'll either we're gonna be reacting to it and changing it in mm -hmm. in ways saying, well, actually, we didn't, I, mean, I don't really like the thing that the secretary recommended and how to deal with these things, so it it seems to me that it and adds a step that doesn't necessarily need to be in there. That once we make the decisions, we then tell the secretary this is how, to, how, how we want you to do it. I think that given the, the state that we're, I think that is the ideal situation, but we're not in an ideal situation given the timing and the, the crossover and need to move forward on it. So I, I'm, I'm okay with, with really doing that work in January, basically saying, let's have, and there, maybe there's wording changes here, like who, who's involved or something, but I think I'd be okay with reacting to how the agency addresses this issue without, without a more detailed plan on how to do it better. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Andrew has summarized what way I would look at it too. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily ideal um, but especially if there's a contention with the agency which we have experienced in the past and it's always an unfortunate situation um, but I would like to move ahead as quickly as possible and uh, let's just give them some parameters and they are going to I mean you right that Brad James is going to do the work regardless you know we need for him to and um, We'll be here in January, but you guys can come. Oh, you can come back. <laughs> and when, uh, when we, in the past, when we either contemplated or passed a major piece of law, AOE works in the off season, and they, uh, very helpfully, when the next session starts, they come to me with things like, we're asking here, what are the unintended consequences of this? How does this interact with this piece going into uh, effect? Etc. So, I don't think that this will be um, a huge amount of work for them. What what there might be is some, uh, you know, as we've experienced, some people who are really passionate in favor of it, and some people who are really skeptical of it. And the agency will, for a period of time, have to absorb that uh, public pressure. But then it will shift back to us in January when we are in. And go forward from there. Yeah. Do you want to hear my comments on the wording? Are we at Please. this stage? So I, I will consider that we're taking this approach and now we're working on the wording of that approach. So on the final paragraph of the findings, yeah. I feel like I remember a conversation before that we had other concerns other than just the tax rates. And I think it would be good to reiterate those in the findings, which I think are captured in number three. We're asking for these. There's are, there are other issues that need to be dealt with. One of the reasons we're not implementing it right away is because it is complicated. Yeah. And I think it would be good to say that in the findings because I think people will say, oh, you're only doing this because you're worried about tax rates. We're like, well, no, that that is an issue. But there are some real questions about <laughs> that we list here in three that need to be considered mm -hmm. as a reason why we're not doing it right away and not just tax rates. What, what would you suggest adding there? Something well, I guess it would be what's in three. I, I, don't, I don't know if there's other things. In but three. 
face it three below as, as oh, the oh, things that they're doing because we're asking them to do those things because we don't there's issues right mm -hmm. so I'm assuming because we're asking do do the things in, in three those are reasons why we're not implementing yeah. the waiting studies now yeah so I just think it would be good to if we're going to have a comment about why we're doing this mm -hmm. I don't if, if we're going to have it in the law and the findings I would rather it be more than just fluctuations in tax rates because that's what it looks like I mean we we could just eliminate that fourth paragraph. Right, if we don't want to say, and that, that doesn't have to be in the law, we can just say that when people ask us, why aren't you yeah. doing it right away? And we say, like, well, it's complicated. Um, because also I wonder, wondered about phase approach to implement the findings. You guys are more familiar with the study, but I think the findings says other, other things in the findings other than the waiting studies, but really it's a question about phase approach to implementing of the waiting studies and these other issues. Mm -hmm. So I thought that part of that sentence did. Which would sense. you prefer? Now that I think about it, I, I'd kind of like maybe to get rid of that fourth paragraph. Um, I'm, I'm okay with getting rid of it. Okay. I don't feel like it needs to be in there, but if, if we want to have a state statement apply. Well, I do think though that some people feel they like will we want. gotta go faster. Yes. You know, so I, I, I think it's not a bad idea to have something in there why it needs okay. to be phased in because you know when do people want us to do it yesterday yes, yes. they want it instant yeah right yeah. Um, so I, I mean what I would recommend if we're going to keep it is it the, the reality that the, the change in tax rates across the map in other complicating factors or yeah, you know three yeah. well, how about saying, uh, we've chosen to develop I don't know if it's maybe have we developed a, a, a chosen to develop a phased approach, or we've just asked them to write a study well, about that? No, it says uh, under one that we want a timeline for phasing in mm -hmm. over three years. Oh, yeah. okay. So, okay. Where we, we so that's that's a decision for us too. I put I put three years, um, and I put a phased approach because it seemed like our discussions have been moving in that direction. Does anybody think? Three is too long or too short? Well, I think given the reality, I, know, I, I mean, yeah. like, you know, with special ed funding, and the, I mean, everything just takes mm -hmm. a while to, for people to get used to. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a one year hit on some of those communities, especially like I've got one 52 cents, that would be. You'd have the opposite riot at the state house <laughs> that we had yesterday. It's 17. Yeah, which is still a lot, but yeah, yeah. But it gradually gets there and allows them to prepare, mm -hmm. sell their homes, or do what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so um, Jim, did you? Well, in terms of complexity, yeah, I would just propose um, on the second line there. It says, and the reality that any change in the winning formula is complex and will produce fluctuations in tax rates. Yeah. Is that enough for you, um, it's Invo involves a number of yeah, complex no. factors. Yeah. Uh, you know, or, yeah, involves the interactions with other state education policies that need to be considered. I guess is what I'd like to <coughs> be clear that there's there's really other things that are happening that interact with it that need to be figured out. Well, and we did hear in Winooski that implementing immediately might be difficult on their budget. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Just they could <laughs> right. they have the influx of cash. You get a higher fee. Do with it. Have right. they people they could acquire some kind of plan. Okay. And then and then I I worry that implementation of the findings is too broad because I mean I, my understanding of the study is that there's a lot of other findings. Okay. Is it all the findings? Or because I'd like, didn't they have a finding about special education, for example, that we're not asking them? So we can say the legislature has chosen to develop a phased approach to um, revising the formula? Yeah. Then I had a Non operating districts, just so I remember, that's the districts that don't have schools, right? They tuition all their students. Right. 
that's another one of the complicating things. That, that might be one of the most complicated things I can think of, actually, right there. Right. Because you have a school district that's tuition that pays the average tuition for the school they're going to. So that's like 15000 But under the way formula, that kid could cost 40000 bucks. So they'll get $40,000. Will break. it be based on the kid? Because Well, this is the issue. Oh. It's very complicated because they're, they're paying tuition 15 but the kid costs 40 right? So they're getting tax break at 40 but they're only paying 15 So obviously there has to be some it's adjustment there or something. But yeah. Jim, it's isn't um, if you tuition your uh, child out, you, you send this, the initial payment from yeah. sending school. And then partway through the year or toward the end of the year, you get a second bill. Um, and then you have to make that up. So there's always a, re a balance for Rutland Town, let's say, sending to Rutland High School. So they send the initial, and then afterwards there's a follow-up. There's, there's another bill that follows that they have to pay at their discretion. Really, we, Rutland Town, wouldn't have any say. Yeah. Is that how that will still be this way now? It's or? unclear. This is, a, this is what it needs to be. be Explore here, I think, in terms of this right. issue. My, my my concern is that the the Sandy Town gets the ADM count, so the non tuition district gets the ADM count of that child. What's the ADM? ADM is average daily membership, yeah. so it goes into their equalized pupil calculation. Right. They get the tax benefit if, if it's a very expensive child. They should get a tax benefit under the new formula, but that. And the current law would be passed over to the receiving district, who's actually got to educate that very expensive child. So there's a whole issue about sending the receiving schools. And mm -hmm. We've had this debate for years, right? About mm -hmm. eight money following the child, but this points out it in a historic way, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And the, so. tui the receiving town gets the tuition rate, which is lower than yeah. what would be the weighted value of a student if it's student in poverty or student, e or student in poverty and an EL. This is exactly right. the kind of policy decision right. that needs to be made before this can be implemented. Right, which I want to make sure we say that's why we're, why we can't do it right away. Um, and then again, so the, the agency will, will attempt to work out those problems. Yeah. They'll come to us with their um, plan for how to deal with that. And then we'll, you know, like that uh, tuitioning town piece Maybe we don't like what they've come up with, and we, we change it and plan it goes to the Senate. Um, so we're not giving up with this any of our policy making, and nobody who votes for it is giving up the right to say no in general. It's just moving it to a, a stage where it will be ready to implement with the green marker if, if we like it. One question I have for, for for your direction here. You get in direction in lots of areas, but one area I'm wondering about are the benefits from Act 46 mergers. The incentives, so for example, there's a governor on how fast rates can change, mm -hmm. by 5%. Um, and uh, there's obviously sponsored grants became merger support grants. So my only question here is, do you want to give direction to the state board, sorry, the Agency of Education, not to mess with those incentives? Well, or do you, you in your language, you mentioned it as one thing for them to consider. Yeah. Um, incentives created under Act 46. Yeah. And again, I, I think um, in the context of the plan they put together, they'll make a decision. Same with the, with yeah. the excess spending penalty. Yeah. Because when uh, Chloe did her calculations, she waived the excess spending penalty yeah. because this was going to send more districts over that line. I think that makes sense, but the agency, as they put this together, will have it as one data point among the others, and they'll come to us and explain how they can mesh together if we agree that we green light it, otherwise we change it. Just one other wording question yep. on this. In B on the second page, midway through that paragraph, it says, This testimony the board shall refer. I rewrote that. You rewrote that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like the. It's kind of old <laughs> English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Plus, I wasn't 100 percent sure of like that we're, what the testimony was. But. So. Other other thoughts about what's here. So we already discussed changing section three so that it doesn't say it's the signature of the governor since the governor has been more time. Yeah. 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 Do you have enough sense of I, how to redraft? I, I have enough sense and my only question is, is timing because I can go do this right now and be back a half hour or we can go on to the miscellaneous bill or whatever you want to do. Why don't we go until tomorrow? Okay. Yep. So if you can bring it back tomorrow. Okay, yep. um, I want to give Emily a chance to go back and talk to the secretary. If he wants to give me a call, we can discuss it. Um, but I, I don't want to, there's no need really to vote on it okay. right this second. Okay, okay. So, um, oh, is he going to speak to this? Okay. You want to give him a call? Don Collins wanted to testify. You're Don Collins. He couldn't make the meeting for <coughs> is he the concerns about that. Who's he? he was a senator from Franklin County from 02 to 08. And again from 11 to 13. Okay. He was your last one. Senator. Hey Don, it's Phil Baruch from Senate Education. How are you? Hello. Can you hear me, Don? I can hear you now, yes. Okay. Uh, so, welcome to Senate Education again. Don used to sit in that chair. <laughs> um, but I'm here with the committee, Senators Ingram, uh, Parent, McNeil, Hardy, and Perchlick, and Jim Sounds Denver. Like a big crew. Yeah. And uh, we have some people in the room with us, and we are talking about the, the idea that you and I discussed um, for moving ahead on the waiting study. Very good, very good. And I, I know how things happen, so my remarks are based on what the bill looked like yesterday. Right. Uh, well, I think uh, that your staff assistant probably gave you a copy of what I forwarded today? Yes. Okay. If, uh, if I could uh, have a few moments, I would just like to go through it with you. Yeah, please don't. Okay. And uh, I do not use the term honorable loosely. Uh, I know that you're all very hardworking, honest, honorable people, but I thought it'd be a good way to start off on the right foot. <laughs> uh, you know, I have been involved in the school business for quite a few years. And I want to be very transparent that I am a school board member here. I've been there, I think it's my 15th year. Uh, but as far as the study, the waiting study, uh, the superintendent and myself uh, first heard about it at uh, Fairley at the conference, the superintendent school board conference. And I believe at least one other member has uh, gone to some presentation, has some knowledge. Our superintendent brought the uh, information to us at a meeting earlier, but with uh, the new merge district and building a budget, teacher negotiations, we haven't spent a lot of time, but it is on our agenda uh, for our next meeting. Uh, it'll be more of a making certain everybody is ready and get their questions together, and then we will spend time over the, on it over the next month. Because it is, it is of interest. I have a number of people uh, and school board members say, you know, what's happening with this? What, what, what will it do? So I just want people to know I am a citizen. I'm speaking as a citizen today, uh, but certainly I'm involved in education. Uh, I, I'm just so impressed when I hear Tammy and the other people speak about the work they've done. Uh, I've read a lot of reports, uh, always been interested in research, and uh, I just uh, give them the highest uh, commendations for the quality of the work. And I do think it uh, has a major impact. I've been lucky enough to live through and be a part of the Union School Movement of the 60s and 70s, and then certainly more recently Act 46. And I, I think this one has uh, greater potential uh, to change the quality of education for our young people uh, than probably either one of them in, in my mind, although the Union School Movement 
certainly was very significant for the time that happened. Uh, so I go on to say how important I think it is, and I think action needs to happen now. And I, I'm very pleased, Senator, to think that you are taking this up and that you do have some thoughts you put forward, which I just have to agree with, but uh, I think that uh, keeping it moving is going to be critical. Uh, having been a member of the State Board, I'm very pleased that uh, you were suggested that they be involved. They are our Vermonters on the ground. They represent uh, our communities, certainly, as well as a field of education. So involving them, both of those groups is wonderful. One little aside I would suggest that when the space schedule is made up, if this moves forward in this manner, uh, that every legislator whose district or area in which they are going to appear uh, be notified and be asked to attend, invited to attend. Mm -hmm. Legislators need to understand this, and having uh, been a little bit involved in the legislature at an earlier time, I know sometimes it's really difficult to engage legislators who feel that they have so many other things on their plate. So this would be a good opportunity for legislators who want to and need to become more involved to, to go to those sessions. And I think that uh, it would be helpful for everyone. Uh, you know, I, I think I do go on and mention the UVM personnel, Tammy and others, JFO. Uh, I would hope that uh, we have some money to put behind this uh, to support these people and to even help the uh, state board. It appears to me at times a little aside that the state board is being starved. It, when I was there, uh, we had staffing, and it did make a difference. But putting those aside, I do like the idea, wholeheartedly support the idea of agency of that and state board taking some leadership. So that's really good. Uh, I know there are people out there. I know some people last night were at the state house, and they want action now. And uh, hopefully, that uh, hopefully something will uh, immediate will make a difference. Uh, personally, I you know I respect them and I'm in uh, agreement with them. But I also know that the process takes time if it's going to be done well. Uh, there needs to be a lot of dialogue, a lot of data collection. There needs to be uh, engagement by all the stakeholders. So I uh, ended my report I think a little differently and pretty much said, you know, it needs to happen now, but now would probably be the next session, uh, which is next January. So, you know, I appreciate it. I respect you people. I appreciate the chance to talk. Uh, but I also know that a, that a thoughtful process engaging a multitude of people is the only thing that's going to make this work. But it really does need to work. Uh, the young people of Vermont deserve it. And, uh, you know, it's not going to mean a lot of money necessarily going to school districts, but it is going to have an impact as people sit around and always ask that question at budget time, what's it going to do to my taxes? So I guess in a nutshell, Senator, that's what I wish to say. Well, thank you very much, Don. That's helpful. Um, any questions from the committee to Don? Well, thanks again for uh, your years of service to the educational community, Don. And tell Senator Perrin I'm going to be bending his ear. <laughs> I believe I arranged for his first trip to the State House. You did. Back That's when he was a that. good uh, supporter of a Democratic candidate. <laughs> 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 All right, have a good day, Don. Stay safe. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Room down here with one on the cemetery. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Um, Jim, do you have a new miscellaneous? There uh, well, it's new as of a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> we have been through it, so it's, it's worth going through. 6.1? We, we have been through. We have not been through. Okay, this so let's do that then. Yeah. So we'll put this aside. Jim will come back tomorrow with a revised draft. Yep. Um, this is one. Yes. Uh, yes. Draft 6.1.
Is it 224? 224, yeah. Oh, this is, this happens to be 6.1 of another bill. <laughs> That's not the right. My copy of 226. 271? Ruth, is this your new Yes. I'm sorry, Jim. What, what was the draft number? 6.1. I had a 5.1. I have 5.1. I have this point. Is this one of those ones that goes in reverse order? No. Nope. <laughs> I don't think we have. I have a 5.1. The 6.1 was of another bill. Yeah, I have a, a 5.1 too. I have 2.1. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe it's a. Get the bills introduced. Hang on. I said to you, Gene, actually a while ago because. Yeah. I'm looking at yeah. It may have been before the break. Does everybody else have I, I a copy? I have no. Five point one is the last version I have. Okay. I was thinking six point one before the break, but it's a while ago. So we're gonna go. Okay. Committee, then let's take a ten minute break. Yeah. We'll come back at yeah. three twenty five. Yeah. 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 So we're walking through draft uh, six point one of S224, which is the mis Miscellaneous Education Bill, uh, the records of the Neighborhood Council. Changes, as usual, are in yellow. The first yellow we have is way up on page 9. So this is a series of, of changes. I'm sorry, before we go on, the wellness policy, did Ruth give you her, did you draft that? I did. But, but that's not this. I have been, no, I haven't asked to put it in the bill. Okay, sounds yeah, good. Yeah. Um, but it is the same, that this is the bill where that would go? Yes, yes. Okay. yeah, yeah. So there's a section in the bill right now, it's section um, five on page six. Mm -hmm. And that language that you have there that for uh, Senator Harding would go here, okay? Um, okay. Section five on page six. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a section oh, five. I see. Oh, page, page six. six. Page six. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's the reverse. Okay. So we're walking through changes in the bill, and then we'll go to your okay. language, which is not current. Correct. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go to page nine. And these are changes that you passed out last year. Uh, they do two things. They dates from this timeline that we went through in January, and what I mentioned to you then was that while the uh, census-based funding was delayed by a year, um, and the SBE rules were, were uh, delayed by a year, all the intermediate dates in the bill had not been changed. So this fixes that okay. and changes all those dates to make it conform with the date changes you made last year. The second thing this section does is it makes various technical changes that were um, requested by the agency. Okay. So Jim, the fact that this is in yellow but not underlined means? There's underlying. Yeah, it is underlined. Uh, well, so if, if it's in yellow but is not underlined it's the current law. Yeah, you, yellow just means it's new, a new okay. change to this, this draft, right? Okay. That last draft didn't have this in it, so that's why it's yellow. Okay. It didn't have the whole section. It didn't have any of this stuff in it, in that sense. Right. Okay. Um, so, as usual, we're, we're just talking about underlining. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So keep going. Keep going. Okay. So walk through this language, or yeah, okay. Okay. So um, first change is from the AOE on line thirteen, page nine. Um, so this is definition of long-term membership, and uh, I think it's a clarifying change. It's the most recent three school years uh, for which data are available. And then the next change is on page ten. Um, 
this is now uh, another recommendation by the agency. This is now using that term long-term membership um, rather than um, uh, using the uh, reference to AVM for this year. So conforming basically both. Um, yeah. And then uh, uh, line six is a date change to along with the new dates. Likewise, on page 11, these are all date changes. Uh, on first half of the page, when you get down to um, line 14, these are technical changes requested by the agency. Um, really around changing the word expenditure or cost to fund funding. Um, that brings you over to page 12. Um, this is a change requested by the agency again. This is the ability to use some funds for unusual uh, special education costs. They're striking out the language on 11 through 14 that has a 2% um, buffer there for this purpose. And now it says, um, um, Secretary may use funds for all special education expenditures as defined by the state board uh, to directly assist SUs um, uh, with expenditures of an unusual or unexpected nature. Um, so and it says these funds should be appropriate in the amount of 2% times the census grant. So I think Emily is best, um, uh, could best describe why this language is changing, but that's, those are, are the, the nature of the changes. Next section is transition. So again, the eight changes that go forth to this new timeline here. Uh, there's a reference on page 11, uh, line 11 to uh, require any IDA reporting um, as well that came from the, the uh, agency. Uh, line 19 is the date change again to go with this timeline. And that's it. I'm going to the, the, the UVM. Okay. The VFC you want to just keep going through the. Yeah. So these are just changes that came up from the last uh, time you talked about this. So now line five is um, uh, the UVM is composed of. Uh, 20 men and 5 women currently. Then uh, line 11, we change the language to say um, members who identify as women. Debbie, is that what we... Yes. That, that's the language you want? Yeah, let's okay. yeah. Yeah. Likewise, on page 13 for um, uh, the VSC board, and then uh, it says the UVM self-perpetuating board members have an obligation to address the board's gender balance and the appointment of trustees. And then likewise, on line 18, talking about um, the General Assembly, um, it says those appointed by the General Assembly and those uh, appointed by self professional trustees, as well as student trustees, is also incumbent on the legislative and executive branches to um, reach uh, the balance. And then in page 15, uh, sub D now reads, on before July 31, 2021, and annually thereafter, as part of their annual budget presentations to the General Assembly, UVM and VSC shall provide at a minimum the most recent five years of information on the gender composition of their respective boards. This information shall include the appointing entity, initial appointment date, length of service, and to summarize recruitment and replacement strategies employed for recently expired and expired positions. I like that. Um, Questions for Jim on either of those two sections? So, um, I don't know how the committee's feeling about this bill. It feels pretty dumb to me. Um, I would say let's let the special education language lay over till tomorrow, but we already passed it um, basically last year. So, um, the only thing left, I think, is the wellness program language. Yep. So Ruth has draft two on the I have a quick question on this. Yep. Are we going to add people, uh, people of color to this for the UPM board? Or is it just, uh, you know, 20 men, 5 women, and then we're going to change it from 12 to 13 members? Identify as women, they're going to be 
also in that either color do we decide or not? I thought the thrust of our discussion was that we wouldn't. No, no, would no, no, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just focus on the gender balance right well, now. For gender, okay. Yeah. Um, and part of my reasoning there is UVM is 60% female, um, but it is, um, it's, yeah, I want to say like 3% uh, people of color. So the composition of the board racially is not um, out of, seriously out of whack, except um, that you have uh, one, I believe, one, no, two African American men as opposed to other racial groups. But the proportion matches the proportion of the, of the student body. Um, whereas the, the women is, um, every class in the UVM has a majority of women in the classroom, pretty much. You mean staff? And teachers? Or you well, no, I, I wouldn't say overall, but the, the faculty overall are about. Forty-seven percent women, um, but some departments like mine are majority. Uh, but again, if it goes to the house and they want to expand um, and tackle the potential racial element, Jim, I think that's a great question. Though it's something we should be yeah. very conscious of. So I appreciate that you asked. Well, uh, okay. Uh, Exactly. Ruth, do you want to tell us what, sure. what happened here? So the wellness program, um, I guess if we are going to include any wellness program provisions in the bill, I would uh, request your support of this draft. Um, the, the reason being is that um, after hearing from our from Tina and the students who came in, um, I did some research on school wellness po programs and there's already statutory language in the existing statutes that's relevant to school wellness programs. I talked to both AOE and the Department of Health and the, there's this section of statutes, one, uh, 16 BSA 136, that is about wellness <coughs> programs and it includes an advisory council, council on wellness and comprehensive health that is not active right now. So one suggestion was to reinvigorate this, this council um, and broaden the definition of wellness program. Um, as you know, I had concerns that it was just fitness and nutrition. So at the bottom of page four on this draft, it would include the comprehensive health education as defined in section 131 of this title. And that um, includes uh, a lot of things, but um, first aid um, and disease prevention, <laughs> particularly relevant right now, <laughs> family health and mental health, personal health habits, consumer health, human growth and development, uh, uh, substance use um, abatement or whatever, whatever. <laughs> uh, nutrition, um, sexual abuse, and sexual violence. Um, so it's a much broader definition, and you can look at it, and the, each of those is defined and described. So adding that is, is part of wellness um, beyond just nutrition and fitness. Um, then uh, these are existing, um, on page three, the existing um, duties of this council. I did get rid of this one duty about collecting the height and weight of students in kindergarten through grade six. I can't find evidence that they do this, and it made me uncomfortable. Um, just having schools report on the height and weight of their students to Department of Health. Um, and then um, the wellness policy report was, uh, which is what the thrust of this was, is on page four. And this just says that the agency in collaboration with the Advisory Council on Wellness this council um, would update and distribute to school districts model school wellness policy. They already do do this. You can see the they have a model school wellness policy that they give to school districts already. It does mostly include just um, fitness and nutrition, um, and they do check these every three years. There's a review under federal law where the agency has to 
review the school wellness policies and grade them. Um, so they already do that and the results are on the website. They already collect a bunch of data, the, the YRBS, the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, they do. Um, and so a lot of what Tina was asking for, they already do. Um, and this would just broaden it and reinstitute this, this council. The other thing is that I guess on page two, I changed the, with expert three, at least three members with expertise in health services, health education, or health policy. Before it was just health services field. I know, I know somebody who used to serve on this who's a pediatrician, so that's kind of a person that they have. Um, and saying that they have to meet not less than twice a year. So this was my attempt to work within what already is done with AOE. I, I talked to both Susan Yesalonia and Rosie Krieger at AOE. Rosie is the school nutrition per, um, di pro program director, and Susan Yesalonia was in here at one point. I think she testified or listened to testimony. She's the health and wellness anal uh, sort of coordinator for the department and works with school nurses, school um, uh, health teachers, and PE teachers. So um, I've sent them the draft, um, haven't heard back from them. I think they're probably a little busy with this current crisis going on. Um, but uh, this is basically based on their recommendations. So I talked to them both on the phone. Um, and the other thing that, that Tina Zook had wanted was that AOE collect all the local policies and post them on the AOE website. Um, that creates a lot of problems for AOE because every time they post something on their website, they have to run it through um, software that makes sure it's accessible. Mm -hmm. And so with hundreds of these policies coming in, it would be a kind of a heavy lift to do it and every time they update their policy. Um, so these policies are posted on local school board sites. So if Tina or her research team wants to get them, they can go to the local school board site. Um, so the one thing that Tina had asked when I talked to her, um, I, she and I have talked a couple times about it, is that she is very interested in maintaining some kind of connection to this, this whole school, whole, whole child or whole child model, the WSCC. So I said that potentially we could say um, uh, um, that shall be in compliance with all. Uh, accepted best practices such as the whole school well that was my question so I think this looks fine the one thing that I'm wondering about is page six in our in our draft mm -hmm. as I remember the testimony they were they were saying that the existing policy which I think you just held up or significantly lower than 85%. And so that's why they specifically wanted to have a target score that was higher to force a, a real rewriting. So in the, in the language on page four of your draft, Ruth, I'm wondering, it just calls for them to update. Because I imagine they would argue that what they've already got complies with relevant state and federal laws and best practices. So they could do a cosmetic update and just... Yeah, so what it does comply with state and federal laws and best practices, but it's only limited to health and nutrition, or to nutrition and fitness. Mm -hmm. And so the, this would broaden it out to these other health factors. And it would be, right now it's just done by the agency, this would reinvigorate this council that would have to work mm -hmm. on it um, and what the agency said about what Rosie was specifically saying about this whole school model is that it's one of the nationally accepted best practices it's not the only one and so there are other ones that you can use to measure school policies and so this is the one that the American Heart Association would prefer that they use but you could probably ask you know the American whatever association and they would say oh this is the one we think is the best um, so the, the, this file, it actually in here, and this is online, you can, I can send you the link if you want, or I think I actually linked to it in the email that I forwarded to you. This actually refers to the whole school, whole child already. It provides links to it. It provides uh, a whole, like, toolkits, yeah, whole school, whole child improvement tool. 
and it has it calls out school districts that have really good policy. I mean, it's hugely comprehensive. They already basically are doing this work. This would just so I guess I'm fine with either going with my proposal and adding in such as yeah. and Tina was okay with that um, or just doing nothing and saying what AOE already does um, I, I don't have I'm not comfortable with the language that Tina proposes because it's it's really specific to what the American Heart Association thinks is the best thing well I like the American Heart Association well yeah but it's there I think that's fine, but they're just one of many, yeah. you know. But um, to go back to page six, what I like about it is it's it's directive toward positive change. So the the agency has to update and redesign with an eye on achieving eighty five percent on this WC, WSCC tool sponsored by the University of Connecticut. That, that's a, you know, it's a very, you can't argue with it if you're the agency, you just have to meet that standard. Whereas the language in, on your page four, it, <coughs> unless I'm missing some way that it will obligate them, it seems like they could, they could almost not do anything based on that. Um, because it says uh, a model policy and compliance and national accepted best practices. And I can't believe that they wouldn't testify that that's what they already have. Well, I think they would say they already have it for um, nutrition and... But, but where does it, I'm missing it, where does it call on them to add the other categories? Because um, the wellness program, the Page one. It's page one down here at the bottom. Wellness program means a program that includes comprehensive health education as defined in section 131 of this title. And what is that? Thing? That's where uh, Senator Hardy was just reading from. Okay. The um, list. There's a big list of things about all kinds of health and safety and. Okay. So it expands the requirement from just fitness and. Can we specify that on page four? Uh, what we can do is like to cross-reference back yeah. to the definition of wellness as, as revised by this act. Yeah. And that would tie it back that definition more directly. Yeah, and making it clear that this expands from what they currently do in positive ways. Um, I mean, you don't have to make that value judgment, but for somebody reading yeah. mm -hmm. um, and it will forestall any argument about whether they need to broaden that. Mm -hmm. Is there an easy way to do that? Yep, yep. yep. Okay. And you can add the such as the, sure. the, the mod, yep. that model. Yep. Um, with, with those changes, I, I think it's fine, and I like the addition of the advisory council. Uh, I imagine Tina did too. Uh, yeah, she didn't know that this existed in current yeah. law. She didn't seem to know that this existed, even though all this is on their website. So Whose website? AOEs, it's not that hard to find. So um, it was, it made me a little suspicious. Um, but uh, let's just say, but she was fine with this draft. I told her I would, a, a, I would ask the committee if we could add that one line. Um, I explained to her about the website thing, um, and then I did just this morning or yesterday, I can't remember, saw the Department of Health person and said this was the direction we are, and they are very excited to have this council back up and running if if this goes through. Any questions for Jim about this? Okay, so um, why, don't, why don't we end for the day, and Jim, if you can tomorrow um, bring us, uh, is this on the list? Yes, we need to Oh, is Katie Ballard in the room? She is. Sorry. I tend to do that. I don't really don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. But before you leave, Jim, so can you um, hit us with a new draft of both the rating and this tomorrow? Yep. And then we'll, um, before we leave, before lights out, we'll try to vote. Okay. And this? We have a new language? 
with Ruth's yeah. language yeah. update. And also the PBL stuff that you want. <coughs> yes. Okay. So just so you guys know what's coming on that, remember we had Dr. Uh, no, I'm not going to be able to remember her name. The woman who's in charge of PBL for AOE. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I asked her about the possibility of them providing language for an appropriation. So I've done that. I've asked Jim to stick in the amount of $400,000. So, because why not? Yeah. Um, but the idea would be to use it for grants to specifically allow them to help districts, mostly that are having trouble with um, transcripts. Mm -hmm. You know, the design work that we saw some districts were capable of doing. Um, with that amount of money, they should be able to have somebody go out to the district and help them design new forms if they need them. But that's a, an action piece that we can do without mandating that it would change the operation we've got going already. So we can take a look at that tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. And is that we do it? Jim. Uh, Katie Ballard, I'm a parent, a special ed parent advocate, as well as I represent the Coalition for Disability Rights on the Child Poverty Council. Before I get started, I want to thank you for the opportunity to briefly speak to you today. And um, I just want to show, these are my two sons, Peyton and Noah. Oh, went away. <laughs> these are my two boys. I'm going to be speaking a little bit about our experience, and I just thought it was really important to share that. Before I, I dive in, I just want to say when I was overhearing some of the conversation on the break, a couple of things stood out to me. You knew, there was some conversation about the AOE feeling a bit like their feet underwater. I think they used a swan, and I believe you, sir, also mentioned feeling like you had heard a lot about special ed and had a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to encourage you to imagine how it feels to be a parent navigating that system and also a parent navigating that system when you don't have the resources to access the supports that other folks do. It is incredibly draining, emotional, frustrating, and the worst experience that I've ever experienced in a system. I have three children. One is my daughter's 14. She is neurotypical on the honor roll for her two first quarters in high school and loves learning. I have two boys, a 12-year-old in seventh grade and a six-year-old in first grade, both of whom are on IEPs. I'm going to apologize because this week has been an incredibly challenging week. And I think it highlights for me the advocacy work that we've been doing in the house for the literacy bills. And I'd like to use that example to explain a little bit why I feel like the Senate committee really could help the parents who are, are seeking support. So my two boys, um, my older son has been in special education since kindergarten. So that means he's in seventh grade, he's had seven years, ideally on an IEP. That means he's had three evaluations, actually four, because he did have a, a, a records review that got him on it, so four evaluations. In 2013, his special educator didn't provide three months of services. She raised a concern about learning disabilities, but never brought it to the team. In a meeting with the LEA, the special ed director, she told me that she thought he had dyslexia and learning disabilities. She just adjusted the way she was teaching him, but never raised the concern to the team. At that point, I raised my concern but I was not as knowledgeable and experienced as I am in special ed now because I've had to become an expert. They did not at any point ever tell me that there was any further assessments that could have been done to identify learning disabilities. I asked. Now, for two years, I attended weekly team meetings. Since then, I've attended monthly team meetings. This week, I've had five hours of team meetings to discuss the Stern Center report. The Stern Center report came back showing my son had dyslexia, dysgraphia, 
this calculia. And at some point in his academics, they took off his learning disabilities. He qualified for SLDs, and at some point, they disappeared. What are SLDs? So specific learning disabilities. And they do have requirements and regulations in our statute currently that I, I think my biggest concern is that I've seen in the House Committee and I've seen very often in my other advocacy that far too often the voice of our associations and the professionals are taken at a higher weight than your constituents and your voters. 30 people, children, families, educators attended a public hearing and spoke and almost all of them shared the exact same experience. They were not identified they struggled, their parents advocated, there was data and testing that showed significant deficits and nobody helped them. IEPs or individualized education programs are developed individually for a reason. But often what I see as a parent for my two boys and as a special ed advocate across the state are IEPs that are developed without appropriate evaluation, with, with inappropriate services and goals and instruction because those evaluations weren't done appropriately. We are obligated to evaluate, assess, and identify all areas of suspe suspected disability for these children. When I go into seventh grade with my son and I have been advocating his entire academic career, that he has learning disabilities. Those learning disabilities are discounted and ignored and he is written off as an emotionally disturbed child. There are years of records that paint him as refusing to do work, as non-compliant, as, as aggressive. And the truth is, for years we presented him with frustrational level work that he didn't even have the ability to do. When we did the Stern Center report, it showed that he had some amazing compensation skills. And that right there is the challenge. Our children develop significant compensation skills, which allows these inconsistent or inappropriate assessments that are used in the schools right now to, to miss the serious deficits in basic skills. And it's concerning to me to hear from all of these associations that they don't want the word dyslexia in a bill. They don't want the definition in a bill. Can you just say why? So what was their reasoning? Their reasoning, one, was because they, so I don't totally understand it, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, they didn't want other children who are struggling to read or have learning disabilities to not get captured and they felt like identifying dyslexia was unfair to the other children. I would advocate there was a public hearing on the bill and if other families dealing with those issues really, they had an opportunity. We heard from more than 30 children, families, educators, you had dozens of written testimony that came in and hundreds of constituents in the state who signed a petition saying that this is, this is important and they want people to pay attention to it. We understand as advocates, as parents, as disability advocates, that there are hard conversations that come with changing things. But if you want to end the generational poverty cycle and, and the discrimination that's faced by our children with disabilities, we have to get into that uncomfortable place and have a conversation about the experience in the building, on the ground, and not what's on paper. In the House Ed Committee, um, one of the things that Madam Chair um, and I spoke a lot about was language, and she was struggling to noodle all the language because we, we wanted the word. 46 other states, 46 other states have bills with the word dyslexia in it and definitions. Vermont does not. 
Other states are building handbooks, dyslexia handbooks. They're amazing. They're resources for teachers so that they don't have to necessarily be engaged with the AOE on the ground, but there's still understanding of these terms. There are states like Wisconsin recently passed their bill. The governor recently signed it. They actually had a joint legislative study committee that included members of their House, members of the Senate, and public members in various capacities. Pediatrician, I think, was on it. There is nothing in Vermont happening like that. We heard from our own, I heard from my own superintendent and curriculum director the amazing things being done in my district around literacy. That was the most heartbreaking testimony to have to sit through to know that my son has experienced years, years, that they knew he had a learning disability and they didn't do anything. If this can happen to a parent who has become an expert, I know my procedural safeguards, I know the, the regs, I know the federal, I actually just went to a training to become certified to be able to, to do due process hearings for parents because I've had more than 100 families reach out to me across the state just to talk about their experiences and they're so similar and they're so heartbreaking. These children are getting so much trauma just because we are not overseeing and in compliance. So I'm delighted to have your testimony. I know it's hard. Um, I just want to clarify something which has been a point of confusion since we picked up this bill. So the original title of this was an act relating to evidence-based structured literacy instruction. I just want to clarify, are you referring to the one that Senator Ingram introduced or the House one? Because there's the been four. Senator Ingram has introduced. But all the way of saying, we we may take up literacy assuming that the House bill reaches us. If the House bill doesn't reach us, we won't. Um, but it, it looks good that their bill will get to us. But some people interested in literacy have showed up when this comes on the schedule for that, for that reason, thinking that we're currently talking about it. Not that we can't remember your testimony. And You'll see me again when the bill is on. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, I'll be camped right here. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, if I may. Um, today was supposed to be disability awareness day, yes. and it was canceled for all the obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, but Kate Ballard was originally scheduled to, to testify as part of disability awareness day, and that's yeah. why it's not necessarily germane to something in their agenda today. It's always germane. I mean, we, as you heard during the break, we've involved ourselves um, very deeply in special ed, and the parents are um, the best resource. We'll find. So is there anything else you wanted to say? So my main reason for, for speaking to some of this is I really want to encourage the committee to, one, take testimony from parents and advocates and, not, and, and be open to what they're saying. And when you hear, because I, I'm going to make sure our voices are in here, when you hear these things, to take the time to look at what we're saying. Because when the House Ed Committee did that and they raised a, a policy that was supposedly on the books, come to find out nobody could even answer whether or not it had been sunset, if the reports, I mean the AOE, the, the legal counsel, nobody even knew what happened to it. So I just, as, as a disability advocate, I feel it's very important for, you, for me to say we need to really look at how we're identifying and supporting these children and, and that oversight needs to be really looked at and how we're identifying kids and if we start identifying and, and the oversight is there for the services from the AOE and we're in the buildings making sure these are happening, I believe our scores will go up and I believe you'll see a decrease in, in cost because you don't have to provide the intensive remediation and the intensive level of supports if you're actually providing quality supports. So I just, I really want this committee to hear and recognize that there are hundreds of people who want to be engaged, who are voters, who, who are engaged, and, and that they need to be in this room just as much as those associations. Because I sat in the House Ed Committee for hours over weeks, 
and I watched as they they literally advocated against everything and their reason was they didn't want to complicate things they didn't want to be duplicitous <coughs> but they never actually provided any documentation or data that supported not using the term um, I look forward to engaging with the committee further and and I really appreciate the committee's time and an effort to support our, our children and families Absolutely. So is, is there a specific bill that you do recommend and, and does it have everything you are advocating for or is it just in general this overall issue that you want us to spend more time in or, or do, is there one of them there like this is the one that we So Representative Kubli wrote a, a very well written bill that included most of the things that we're advocating for. I would encourage the committee to look at Representative Coopley's bill in addition to Senator Ingram's bill and and to really and and if you have time you can look at some of the other states Wisconsin Arkansas Mississippi um, Maryland they're all doing really this is all something that all the other states seem to be really picking up and addressing I had heard that the house was taking one approach in fact Vermont Digger had an article about that. yeah we talked to her about that and then there was a, a shift away from mandatory screening for instance um, but you know, I have to just point out my own ignorance on the topic right now. I have worked with the Stern Center a little bit, but we haven't done our homework yet on literacy to know. Um, what well, we did think just make yeah, when you were gone. gone. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. Just so you're aware, more than 60% of our fourth grade children are not able to read at grade level. Mm -hmm. This is truly something that deserves equal and as much attention as any other crisis. In, in that in the chamber right now I would I would advocate well thank you so much well I just want to, to just uh, acknowledge uh, Katie's uh, is on the um, uh, Child Poverty Council and uh, that, that I chaired during the off session and she has been an invaluable member she's really yeah. made great contributions to that Senator McNeil is on that uh, <laughs> thank you I appreciate that we is Jim also in value Always, <laughs> always, <laughs> especially with the best. I take you. In that. <laughs> where do you? Just where? What school district do your kids go to? Essex Westford School District. So, post merger, how are people liking things? I'll be honest. If it weren't for the merger, I don't know where my family would be. What we experienced in the town was horrendous, and and while things aren't necessarily ideal or perfect. I recognize and appreciate the very amazing things that have come from the merger. And and the leadership has been engaged. I, I think, again, this is a breakdown in in understanding the, the regulations of IDEA and, and accountability. I'm very glad to hear you say that. I went out before Act 46. I went out to Westbrook. And that's your car. I went out to Westbrook, and, and they were they were livid about their tax rates, um, but it was because they were all alone and they had phantom students, you know, declining enrollment. And I, at that time, I was saying to them, we're, we're in the early stages of doing this thing that would create bigger districts, and I really think it would help you. So it's good, good to know because they were they were good about jumping on board. When it comes to Beth Cobb and, and the administration has truly been amazing. Aaron McGuire as an LEA has been amazing. I think the challenge comes into a systematic. Yeah. Um, if people are not boots on the ground in our school buildings, they don't really seem to know what's going on. They just go by what they see in the computer or paper. And if parents aren't informed and don't have access to supports because of their, their funding resources, if this is happening to me and I am as engaged in its form as I am, what is happening to all of these other children? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your So, committee, um, obviously we have one more afternoon before crossover. Jim's going to come in with the drafts tomorrow. My, my thought is that we'll stay as long as we're working on those drafts. If we pass them out in five minutes, then we're just going home. Um, I'm half suspecting that there will be some announcement tomorrow about what's going to happen next week. But I haven't heard anything specific about that. But um, if it takes us longer,
to work on the bills. We don't have any other data to defer them to. So we'll have to stay tomorrow until we either pass both out or, or realize that we're not going to pass one of the two out. So uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is there's a chance we might be later tomorrow, but given our discussions today, I don't, I don't think so. Any, any final? Um, there you go. These two bills, right? I mean, that's all we yeah. need. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah, we've incorporated. The miscellaneous bill has, I think, five or six bills on it. Huh. Um, so we'll have, by that measure, we'll have put out 10 bills of the session.